aspects of the frequency licensing and shared spectrum framework for community networks. I'd like to confirm that we, all our panelists are on board. We are ready to start subject to any heads up from our organizers. I would want to kick off this session straight away so that we can finish in good time. So thank you for all the panelists who have also joined us. We look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to having a fairly exciting time to discuss aspects of um, licensing and spectrum framework. Thank you to the CA as well. Uh, without further ado, I just want to run through some of the preliminaries. Um, the first thing would be that I'm sure you would have comments, queries, clarifications that you may wish to make over the course of the session. I will encourage you to type out any questions, queries that you have in the chat. Those will be picked up and addressed to the relevant person. If you could also kindly specify whom to whom the question would be directed, it would be helpful in directing the question. Those will be answered at the tail end of this session. We have about 30 minutes, give or take, for Q&A. Before then, we shall run through the different aspects under the agenda of what we're covering today. We'll have a couple of um, welcome and opening remarks from our panelists, and then we'll go on to the red meat of why we're here. We will ask the consultants to present what this paper is about, and then we will listen to more detail from the regulatory agency, and then have a panel discussion, um, which I have to confess I'm looking forward to um, quite a bit. Now, um, the project is was commenced through the assistance of the CA, through the leadership, I have to say, of the Communications Authority of Kenya. Um, you are all aware that the Communications Authority of Kenya is the ICT regulator in the country with um, various specific responsibilities spelled out under their act. Uh, but this project has been supported by the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, they are the lead consultant, uh, as well as Kicktonet. Um, I, I don't believe there's anything one would do in technology in this country without uh, the involvement of Kicktonet. And so those are sort of the three parties, but uh, I also have to cite that uh, the University of Strathclyde has been extremely helpful um, in helping to develop um, sort of this inclusive framework for communication networks. There's also been support from the United Kingdom, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, so we'd like to recognize that they have been a very significant participant in this. Um, now that CA does regulate ICT, one of the things I'd point out as part of my introduction is that they have a strategic plan which um, is very clear about what the CA is trying to achieve, but key amongst them is to enable access to the dynamic spectrum access framework. And that is something that the CA has endeavored to do through quite a bit of consultation with the public. Um, and this consultation, um, and, and the CA must be celebrated for this, but this consultation is founded in our constitution where it is expected that public entities, public agencies will have a consultative process, um, and which is not intended to be a window dressing activity, but actual evidence of sufficient consultation that has allowed feedback. Um, for those of you who are aware, we did have a high court decision the other day, um, one of which harped of one of its grounds harped on, you know, the lack of proper public consultation. Um, so the CA has a vision um, which seeks to digitally transform our country. And part of what significantly this paper is about is towards enabling access to the shared spectrum, but also providing ease of access to licensing, um, part of which have been a huge problem, particularly for what we are calling community networks. There's a whole category of networks that are able to leverage on very low budgets, they're able to leverage on low cost electronic equipment to provide access to ICTs, uh, which typically the commercial incentivized networks may not be able to do for uh, obvious reasons. And so um, what this is about is trying to figure out a way and get the CA to consider as part of this whole network to provide greater access, to provide easy access to licensing. 
And so without further ado, what I want to do is welcome the Director of Frequency Spectrum Management, Mr. Tom Oluero. He's the Director of Frequency Spectrum Management at the Communications Authority to give um, a fairly short introduction. And I will ask Mr. Oluero thereafter then to welcome the Acting Director General, uh, Mercy Wanjao, or her representative. Um, as you would understand, some of these positions do come with um, short notice meetings. So um, she will be presenting or indeed her directly appointed representative. But over to you, Mr. Tom Oluero. Mr. Tom Oluero, can you hear me? Mr. Sonoya, if it's possible for you to just check with Mr. Oluero um, and find out if he's just about to Commence his right away. Right away. We'll keep doing it. Open Thank you, Max. Um, after Mr. Tom Oluero and the acting director general or her representative, we shall then go to Kiktanet and ask. So and I'll ask Grace Gidaiga to be ready, or Gigi, as she's fondly referred to, uh, to be on standby. And thereafter, we shall have the representative from the BHC, the British High Commission, the Digital Access Program, uh, Mr. Charles Juma to then go in after Gigi speaks. So Mr. Tom Oluero, we're standing by if you're ready to give your opening remarks. So we can see Mr. Oluero. I assume you are about to locate yourself so that you can Mr. Olero, can you hear me? No, I can hear you, Chair. Very well. Just give me a minute. Hello, Chair, I'm ready. Thank you, Mr. Olero. If you could um, just sort of give us your preliminary opening remarks. Would be grateful to hear from you in your capacity as the director of the frequency spectrum management team at the CA. Uh, you have been your team has been very supportive in this project in consulting and providing significant input to the consultants. Would be grateful to, grateful to hear from you um, and thereafter, if you would be so kind um, to welcome the acting director general or her representative to also make their opening remarks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Steve. I'll just have a few opening remarks. I really want to appreciate the cooperation that has gone on from October last year, when we started on this project. Uh, the, the British agency, and uh, APC and other related agencies have been very, very instrumental in enabling us reach this time with this project. And in fact, we actually by end of uh, March, we had already reached the milestones we were intending to reach. And uh, right now we intend to start on public consultation following the approval of this document at the preliminary stage. So really, as we want to just appreciate the assistance we have got, the effort that has gone into this work, and we believe we'll go through greater heights on this topic. I do not want to talk too much because my director general will really talk in details about uh, the appreciation the communication authority has. And from there, we should be able to embark on looking at various aspects. So that's what I have uh, chair. And I think at this point, 
I will uh, ask the representative of Director General Masi Wanjau, who is Mr. Christopher Wambua, to be able to give some remarks. Welcome, uh, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for and the fitness for those uh, actual remarks. I'm here to present uh, Madam Masi Wanjau, who is the Acting Director General of the Communications Authority of Kenya, who was meant to give the welcome remarks, but due to exigencies of duty, she could not make it to this event. She sends her uh, best wishes and uh, apologies for that. So I'll just uh, go straight to her remarks. And I wish to start by first acknowledging Mr. Juma, the Digital Access Program Manager and Advisor at the British High Commission in Kenya, uh, Ms. Grace Githaiga, the convener, Kenya ICT Action Network, Kitanet, members of the Kitanet Forum, yeah, I'm happy to take it. representatives of the Association of Progressive Communications, APC, distinguished stakeholders, stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to welcome you all to this virtual stakeholder consultation exercise on the draft licensing and shared spectrum framework for community networks, networks in Kenya. The authority attaches immense significance to this exercise, given the constitutional and regulatory requirements to ensure that public policy reflects to the greatest extent possible the views and concerns of the public. The consultations are also meant to ensure that the outcome of the, of, of the consultations is fit for purpose and aligned with our immediate realities. I wish at the very outset to thank our partners in this process, the British High Commission through the Digital Access Program, the Association of Progress Com Progressive Communications, the Kenya ICT Action Network Internet, and the University of Strathclyde for the tremendous collaboration that we have had so far. Through your support and guidance, we've been able to come up with practical proposals that are envisaged to assist Kenya, come up with a framework for the licensing of community network, networks in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, we are aware now that access to ICT services is key to enabling our people to make the best of the opportunities that abound in our society. ICT services present the best avenue to redress some of the most pressing issues of our time. But most importantly, the gaping disparities in our societies, especially the digital divide. I'm therefore pleased to report that the authority through the Universal Service Fund has undertaken some initiatives to facilitate widespread availability of ICT services. In the first phase of the voice infrastructure project, we connected over 70 sublocations across 15 counties to mobile communication services. Additionally, we connected 884 public secondary schools to broadband as part of the efforts to integrate ICTs with learning. We have recently awarded tenders for the second phase of the voice infrastructure project that will see 101 sublocations that were previously underserved or unserved benefits from connectivity to mobile communication services. But we all know that while efforts have been made to narrow the digital divide, it is clear to us all that we must be innovative in exploring other immediate and workable approaches that can avail these services throughout the country. During these tough times occasioned by COVID-19 pandemic, ICTs have emerged as key means of both resolving challenges caused by the pandemic and responding to the realities of the new normal. There is therefore an urgent need for low cost internet access services across the country. And development trends indicate that small networks, especially broadband wireless networks and private long-term evolution networks shall be vital 
to closing the digital divide. In light of that, this, it is in light of this that the authority has come up with a framework for community networks and a plan of action for spectrum sharing strategies to ensure optimal access to telecommunication services to our people. The proposed framework provides us with a fresh lens through which we can look at possibilities of enabling communities in various parts of the country to own and manage such infrastructure. These community-owned networks are essential in enabling people with a common objective within a specific geographical area to meet their communication needs through an internet of the people, for the people and by the people approach. Through these networks, we shall strengthen the ability to, for underserved communities to participate meaningfully in the digital economy. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years, the authorities Technology neutral licensing framework has been instrumental in inspiring innovations in the ICT sector, opening up the space for new players and providing consumers with a diversity of choices to make. We are keen on leveraging this approach to open doors to emerging realities, such as community networks. It is now given that where such networks have been successfully deployed, there has been a correspond, corresponding improvement in uptake of ICT services and greater societal good. Type, time is right now, GX stakeholders, to begin imagining what potential these community networks portend and exploring best, the best we can to support such frontiers in our continued quest to enhance access to all in ICTs. We therefore strongly hope that these stakeholder consultative process will provide the much needed perspectives to enrich the proposed licensing and shared spectrum framework for community networks. We encourage openness, cardiness in the interactions because it is only through this that we can make meaningful progress in the task at hand. I certainly look forward to exciting discussions and a clear roadmap for community networks in Kenya. I wish to conclude by Thank you all for showing up and wishing you productive discussions ahead. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wambua. Uh, we are grateful for the opportunity um, and really for the robust participation of the CA right from the onset of this project. We recognize the fact that uh, you do want the participants, not just on this webinar, but as part of the public consultation process to be open, to be candid, to be transparent, uh, because in that is where then the CA will get a lot of buy-in um, and perhaps better ideas in terms of how to frame ultimately the licensing and um, you know, open spectrum framework. So we're thankful very much. Please uh, do convey our thanks to the acting director general. Uh, we trust that um, right to the end of this project, we shall continue to, to see the uh, the support of the CA. So thank you very much for that. I want to move on to uh, to to Gigi now. Um, I would like to ask Gigi, the Kicktonet convener, to go ahead and make your remarks. Thank you very much, and it's good to see you, Gigi. Thanks so much, Kit. Uh, Kiptonet, and also very great to see you, and to also see friends. I actually, um, you know, I have seen so many friends in this call, and I'm really glad that we are all together. Uh, thank you so much, Wambua and uh, Oluero, who I met when we were agitating for community radios in this country. Uh, and so it's really nice to see that uh, he's still on board in, when it comes to community networks. So on behalf of the Kenya ICT Action Network, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder um, grouping of people, and, uh, and we now consider ourselves as a think tank, uh, interested in ICT policy and regulation, uh, we are glad to be part of this process. Kicktonet acts as a catalyst for reform in the ICT sector and is guided by four pillars, namely uh, policy advocacy, stakeholder engagement, capacity building, and research. Kicktonet's guiding philosophy is that of encouraging synergies for ICT policy uh, related activities and initiatives. As such, the network provides mechanisms and a framework for continuing cooperation and collaboration in ICT matters among industry, technical community, academia, 
media development partners and, and the government. So our purpose really is to contribute to the common good in ICT policy making. We address and advocate for the needs of the Kiktanet community. So when I look back at the struggle uh, that communities uh, had to go through um, when I worked in the community radio sector, um, you know, the struggle for them to recognize as a third sector in broadcasting and having Kiktanet having supported that process, uh, we realized that communications authority is in the right path in coming up with this proposed uh, licensing and shared spectrum framework uh, for community networks in Kenya. We are glad to be partnering in this process and are also grateful to other partners, um, uh, namely the Association of Progressive Communications and the FCDO. Now, community networks are defined as telecommunication infrastructure deployed and operated by citizens to meet their own communication needs. And similar to community radios, that was the precursor that addresses the needs of communities they serve community networks are viewed as a solution to spread connectivity to deprived areas with no connectivity or where connectivity is inexpensive and therefore inaccessible. Again, in similar fashion as community radios that continue to create local content, community networks will result in better understanding of digital technologies and tools with communities potentially championing the creation of locally relevant content and services targeting their own needs. And therefore, as Kicktonet, we would like to make a case for support from, a, from the Universal Service Fund so that communities can also move together with everyone else. USF should support the connecting of community networks to allow communities to reap digital dividends as the internet has become important in our daily lives. So communities do not always have to be the last ones in these initiatives. And therefore we are so glad that there's this initiative to move everyone uh, together. We applaud uh, the regulator communications authority for having this type of interventions, which will bridge the digital divide, especially those from poor communities. I cannot overemphasize that affordability of access and connectivity is key. So many telcos have laid fiber, but it seems plans for the last mile are lacking. And yet this is critical. And therefore we see community networks coming in to play a major role. And especially when we move into the next normal because of COVID, because life, you know, we, we are going to depend more, we are consistently going to depend more on the internet. And therefore, uh, community networks will create opportunities that mainstream what the telcos are unable to achieve um, at that last mile connectivity. And we all need together, uh, we must all have a passion to make a, a, a change uh, in society. So thank you so much, CA, for taking this up. We challenge you to roll out these regulations as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gigi. Um, Kicktonet um, has absolutely been in everything that has been good in the ICT sector in this country. And we thank you for continuing to, to do what you do as Kicktonet. Um, thank you very much for your participation. I'd like to remind all the participants, attendees, that um, if you have any questions, please post them on the chat or the Q&A segment, and those will be answered at the tail end of the session. We would also be grateful if you could post your name and the organization that you represent, just so that we have a handle on who has attended. Uh, right now, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Charles to, from the BHC to make some opening remarks. Thank you. Is Charles with us? Okay, perhaps Charles hasn't quite joined. He had uh, indicated that he might be running a bit late from another meeting that he had. In order to save time, uh, we shall now move on to the presentation of the work. Uh, perhaps somewhere down the line, we might get Charles on board to make his opening remarks. So I'd like now to invite the lead consultants, the Association for Progressive Communications um, to make a presentation and just take us through this work 
in summary, um, perhaps if we could do this in about 25 minutes, uh, that would be good. But uh, if you could just take us through, I'd like to invite Josephine, Melisa, Steve, and Carlos Ray. Um, I'm not sure in what order um, you're going to speak, but um, if you could take the floor now. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Can the, the presentation be loaded? Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining. It's actually quite of a turnout with over 100 people attending this, this, this public consultation uh, webinar. And uh, as uh, Stephen was saying, really looking forward to get your views on the, on the framework that uh, Steve, uh, Josephine, and myself have been uh, developing together with the, with the Communications Authority. Um, next, next slide, please. Yeah, so just a, a brief on, 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 on who is APC and what we've been doing on this, on this work. Uh, it's an organization, an international network of civil society organizations that was founded on the, on the 90s and uh, for using or dedicated to using ICTs for social justice. At the moment, we have uh, around 57 organizational members in more than 70 countries. Uh, Kiktanet is, is one of our members uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, and we have been involved in community networking since the 90s. Uh, but more precisely, since 2017, we have been actively supporting community networks, the community network development in 13 countries in the, in the global south. But beyond that active support, we have been engaged on policy training to, to regional uh, regulatory associations, such as CRASA, IACO, WATRA, or even the African Union Commission, uh, as well as involved in, in in creating evidence and developing research that could inform that training, but could also inform uh, decision, decision making at the policy and regulatory level. We have been sharing uh, that evidence at different processes at the global, regional and national levels uh, uh, for, the, for, for the past uh, four years as well, trying to as well uh, give policymakers a different input than the, the, the one that is usually given in those, in those spaces. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, Grace was saying in a way, right, the, the, internet, the internet growth is, is plateauing. Uh, as we can see in this, in this graph that is considering the, the increase on, on the internet penetration uh, or the number of users over the years, we can see how in the last three years is reaching, is reaching a plateau and it's reaching a plateau around 50% of the population. And not only is reaching a plateau, it's like the rate is really declining. We can, if, if we continue at this rate, uh, there is no progression. I, it's, it's really uncertain how things are gonna, are gonna evolve into providing universal affordable access to, to all people, right? And, and this is also the case, the case in Kenya. So there has been great things to, to, to arrive to where we are at the moment and to have provided access to 50% of the population. But we also believe, and there is evidence that shows that things need to be done differently in order to uh, reach the other 50%. And next slide. Because somehow we have connected the, the easy half. If you look at this, uh, at this uh, table as well, where, where we can see the average annual income of the different uh, groups of population according to their, to their income, uh, there is really a big proportion of the population who lives with very little and with by, by whom the, the current models or, or the models that have been used so far in trying to provide in access are not able to produce the revenues that that more commercial model is, is seeking after. And therefore, again, new alternatives need to be considered. 
And among those alternatives are our community networks. And I want to pass now to my colleague, uh, Josephine Melissa, who to, to give us a, um, yeah, a summary of the research that has been done around community networks, both in Africa as well as in Kenya. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, next slide, please. Um, during the, uh, over the past year, uh, we've seen a renewed focus on um, universal access and universal service. And more likely, um, more importantly, I would say the building of the capacities of communities as first respondents during a crisis. And during the opening remark, we had um, the sharing of what community networks are and these uh, bottom-up approaches uh, to connectivity uh, built by the people and for the people. It's not the first time that uh, bottom-up access, mo bottom-up models or bottom-up approaches are being implemented. Uh, we've seen it in different sectors, in agriculture, in finance, in health. And last year, especially during the pandemic, we saw the importance of community health workers in terms of supporting government systems or processes, um, especially during a crisis. And so the whole work around community networks is just about enabling uh, local capacities uh, for them to be able to build their own networks, manage their own networks, uh, to be able to create content that is relevant to them uh, so that it meets the local needs, so that at the end of the day, communities are not just passive users of the internet, but also active contributors. Um, next slide, please. So in, in this work, um, we wanted first to cop out um, Africa uh, to understand how community networks are started and operated. And from research, we found that uh, majority of the community networks are initiated by a champion. And this champion sometimes is from the community or outside of the community, and it can be an individual and also an organization. Uh, so for example, in DRC, uh, PamojaNet was initiated by an organization called La Difference um, at the request of the king uh, or the mom in Idris. Uh, in the case of South Africa, Zenzeleni's roots are a collaboration between university researchers and the local community. Uh, while in Uganda, uh, Bosco has its roots in the Catholic Church under the trusteeship of the Archdiocese of Bulu. The organizational models range from country to country. Um, sorry, just um, the other slide, the previous slide, please. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, so organizational models vary from community to community. Um, there are cases where some are cooperatives, others are NGOs and CBOs. And we've also seen um, an evolution from community radios um, in the case of Macha in Zambia. So there's usually support from a local authority. Um, as mentioned, in the case of DRC, uh, there's support from the Mwami, who is the king. Um, in the case of South Africa, the support from the local authorities who support both the Zitulele and Mankosi uh, networks. So the sense of ownership from the community is really important and that um, the community champions or the, community, the local authority play key roles such as mobilization, advocacy, uh, uh, both at local and national levels. Um, so we've seen, uh, for example, uh, in Uganda in 2019, where there has been efforts uh, from Bosco to uh, collaborate with NITAU um, and also support in terms of the community, local authorities. In the past years during the Africa CN Summit, uh, we've seen local authorities attending. In 2018, we had the headman um, in South Africa hosting the participants. Um, in 2019, the late Chief Kariki from Lanetu Moja and other local municipal heads from Cameroon attended the summit in Tanzania. So in terms of um, who now runs, um, or which entity runs the network operation, um, it's usually led by an anchor organization and their role is service provision, resource mobilization, uh, partnership, advocacy, uh, support in terms of building capacities of the local community. Um, across Africa, there are different technologies that are used uh, from Wi-Fi based technologies um, and network provision can be through hotspots, 
uh, private hotspots as well as community uh, centers. Beyond that, uh, one of the challenges with regards to affordable access is supporting infrastructure such as um, electricity. And so in the case of um, Uganda, um, Bosco um, actually has uh, created power grids uh, powered by solar. And not only do they power their community network, uh, but it also extends to supporting local schools. Um, next slide, please. Given this background, we sought to map out um, existing pilot community networks in Kenya, and we wanted to understand the factors behind the establishment, the operational models, uh, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, during the survey process, we surveyed four community networks or pilot community networks. Uh, the first one is Dunia Moja, uh, established in 2020, uh, championed by La Mukahab, and it's located in Sondia village in Kimisi. Um, the second one is a Harry Community Network. It was established in 2020, um, and it's championed by the Africa Higher Education Research Institute, uh, which has operations in Kisumu, Sia, and Homa Bay. The third one is Lanetu Moja. It was established in 2018, championed by the late Chief Karuki, popularly known as uh, the Teaching Chief, um, and AFTRIX, a network of empowering women with technology skills. And lastly, we have Tunapanda Net, established in 2015, championed by Tumakwanda Kibera CBO, an ICT vocational training center uh, located in Kibera. Factors behind the establishment, uh, um, the main one was um, access to affordable internet. With the exception of Tunapanda, the three others exist in areas where broadband provision is more, mostly by mobile operators. And so it's challenging to access um, or to be able to afford bundles, for example, for video streaming or just um, meaningful work. Um, another motivation was um, supporting, you know, uh, supporting communities in terms of their abilities to uh, interact with the content online or create. So that is in terms of building digital capacities as well as um, creation of content that is relevant to them and mostly in the education sector. Um, all that the end, um, rely on community participation in terms of network deployment um, and operations activities. And these include mass uh, fabrication, infrastructure build, network support and maintenance. Uh, they also rely on the community in terms of aware awareness raising and mobilization. So moving from um, one community to another, it's mostly referrals um, and just champions within the community who come to support. Uh, the communities also host um, and power and provide security for the equipment. Um, and we notice that it, they do not just um, tackle the connectivity or the skills gap, uh, but they're also addressing the gender digital divide in the case of uh, Lanetu Moja, uh, which is a women-led community network and 80% of the decision making uh, is steered by women. And so the network focuses on a gender approach uh, to engage grassroots women in terms of local mobilization strategies. Next slide, please. Uh, beyond uh, just um, the motivation and how they are operated, we also wanted to understand the, um, um, the technologies that they use. And all the CNs uh, use license exams, uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, um, because um, of its um, low cost and also availability of Wi-Fi equipment. Um, the network models, they mostly rely on central management of the core network, which are usually hosted by anchor organization. And then from there, they set up either point-to-point -point or multi-point connections, and they connect different um, entities within the community, so it can be schools, uh, local government hospitals, community health centers, youth and women's centers. The cost of backhaul is the largest expense um, and actually accounts for about 75% of the operational cost. Um, and so um, individually, because of where they are right now, majority of the CNs cannot be able to afford um, to purchase backhaul at um, wholesale prices. Um, something interesting um, or a good step towards the right direction with support from existing operators such as the Kenya Education Network, uh, which supports Tunapanda Net and Lanetu Moja, 
in providing barcodes. Additionally, uh, also other value added services uh, such as technical capacity building support, which most of the community networks actually need. Um, then we sought to understand the challenges that they face um, in terms of operating in this new space. And the first one was licensing. Um, the current model does not um, incorporate uh, community networks. Um, and so it was difficult for them to figure out um, which category they will get licensed for, as well as there was um, challenges in terms of the, of the cost of licensing. High cost to backhaul was another um, uh, major challenge. Um, as I mentioned before, they're still small, and so they're not able to access um, bulk wholesale purchases. Um, another challenge that came up was the high capex cost, and this is the capital expenditure required to deploy community networks. So they need to purchase equipment, which is not cheap. Um, although they use Wi-Fi, which is a bit affordable, they it's still not. Uh, the costs are not down yet to a point where they are able to uh, to really deploy and scale as much as they would like to. And so they are dependent on, on grants from organizations such as the Internet Society and, uh, and APC. Uh, the other challenge is the high cost uh, of spectrum. And so hence majority of them um, actually use the unlicensed band. Uh, but the challenge with this is that it's susceptible to interference affecting network quality. Then other challenges include included um, limited local uh, technical competencies. Um, so whenever they go into a committee or the committees that they're operating, they have to start with capacity building of the local youth uh, for them to be able now to focus on the deployment. Um, there's also limited um, and lack of access to financing. Uh, community networks are serving markets that are not considered to be um, very hold up like business friendly or to have a high return on investment. And so it's challenging for them to receive funding uh, from investors and not just that also in terms of donors and not so many development agencies uh, fund telecommunication infrastructure. Uh, finally, there's the issue of supporting infrastructure such as electricity roads um, that also affect um, them in terms of whether it's starting out or scaling to reach out to more. Thank you, next slide, please. Um, so with that uh, background uh, from CNs, we also sought to not just understand the perspective of the community network, but also other stakeholders that are operating in the telecom um, ecosystem. Um, in Kenya, we have made great strides in terms of in the ICT sector, uh, but broadband provision is still challenging. Um, in fact, um, just about uh, 600,000 uh, people are connected to broadband subscription in Kenya. And so the stakeholder engagement process, um, we wanted to understand the challenges that the existing uh, telecom operators face in terms of de delivering affordable access, uh, what their recommendations to change were, and their views on small scale small scale operators, especially community networks and the role that they play in terms of um, last mile connectivity. So for this uh, particular section, uh, we interviewed um, national facility providers, uh, Tier 1, um, and these were Telcom Kenya, Safaricom, PLC, and some of the challenges that um, affected their ability to provide affordable access were high cost to spectrum, um, and also lack or limited uh, supporting infrastructure. So these are roads, electricity um, in rural areas. The request to the regulator was that uh, request to CA was reduction uh, of the cost of spectrum, um, which included the initial acquisition cost as well as the annual spectrum freeze and administration fee, as well as rethinking um, the taxation framework in a matter that in a manner that promotes affordable access. Uh, we also wanted to understand their views on community networks, and um, uh, most um, of them were not quite familiar with these networks. But um, they emphasized the need of community ownership in ensuring that these networks are viable and sustainable. Next slide, please. Um, NFP Tier Two. We in we spoke to Liquid Telcom, 
uh, Kenneth and KPLC. Um, the challenges, um, challenges that came out were access to affordable vehicles, high cost of spectrum, and congestion in license exempt five gigahertz, uh, which they use for barco links. And the recommendations for change were um, an increment um, of license ex exempt spectrum. There's already congestion on five gigahertz, so the request was if that could be, they could increase a uh, license exempt band. Uh, creation of policies differentiating uh, rural and urban areas. And this was informed by the fact that connecting rural areas is more challenging and requires more investment than urban areas. Um, also, there was a request for no fee uh, to provide backhaul at prices that are affordable to all operators. And uh, we also sought to understand their view on small operators. And um, the recommendation was that um, the CA should consider reducing barriers to entry for small operators and recommended uh, the need for a regulatory framework for community networks and also consider a waiving of these. Um, next slide, please. Um, tier three are mostly the ones that operate within the county boundary. And for us, this was an area of interest because uh, they are contributing to last mile connectivity. Uh, one thing is we're doing our analysis, we noted that out of the 46, um, out, of the, um, out of the 53 NFP tier three licenses, 46 are in Nairobi, one in Mombasa, one in Marsabit, and one, one in Eldoret, one in Nakuru, one in Kilifi, and two in Naniki. This means that 41 of the 40, 41 of the 47 counties are not served by um, NFP tier three licenses. From the ones that we spoke to, uh, the challenges that came out uh, were access to affordable backhaul and spectrum, um, especially for rural areas. Uh, they also noted that there's a growth of um, unlicensed operators um, creating an unfair playing field uh, for the licensed operators because they have the um, uh, operation obligation. Um, in terms of the recommendations to CA, well, consideration, um, consider reducing administrative and li administrative license and compliance requirements, as well as automating submissions of um, the reporting processes. Uh, they also requested um, dynamic access, uh, dynamic spectrum access for underutilized spectrum in underserved areas. Uh, on a light licensing basis. Um, they also recommended reviewing and revising license and spectrum fees. In terms of um, the small scale operators, um, they may be considering creation of an additional tire, lower tire, uh, NFP license with reduced fees and simplified registration requirements so that um, these ones can reach um, underserved areas and maybe serve a smaller population. Um, their view on community networks was that also uh, to this category, not so many of them were familiar with this particular network, but had no opposition, uh, but just said there is need to emphasize on the community ownership so that these networks are sustainable. Um, so that's it. I'd like to hand over to Carlos. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Josephine. And uh, with that, uh, with that evidence, with that research, both from regional and national community networks, as well as from all the views uh, from the stakeholders, we started uh, drafted, drafting the framework. But uh, besides that, uh, I would like to to really show appreciation for how CA has been. Uh, part of the process on, on exploring the different avenues that could make this, uh, this, um, these views from the stakeholders and the community networks possible. And besides, besides that, we have uh, benchmark uh, licensing and spectrum sharing recommendations from another 13 countries around the world. So to make uh, the recommendations as uh, evidence-based as, as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So 
around licensing, there are basically two, two recommendations that we propose uh, and those to be accomplished in the, in the near term. One would be integrating a new license category for community networks within the unified licensing framework uh, review that is currently underway. And the other one, ensuring that uh, the financial and administ administrative requirements for community networks uh, are commensurate with their scope and, and scale, right? As uh, Josephine was describing, they are some sort of a different category that didn't quite exist. Uh, so next slide, please. On, on this regard, uh, we, have, uh, we are proposing a community network service uh, provider license that uh, would be exclusive for uh, community-based organizations as well as for non-governmental organizations. Uh, unlike the, the, tier, the NFP tier three, it would be lim limited in, in its uh, geographic scope down to the sub-county. Uh, it will comprise both uh, an NFP tier three license as well, well sorry, and network infrastructure, a network facilities license, as well as an application service provider uh, license. So it's a single license for operations for, for the communities. Um, the initial and the annual fees would be lower than those existing for, for those two categories. Uh, we are also proposing, because of the nature of their contribution, to be exempted from uh, uh, USF contri contributions. Uh, and in terms of the, the application process and the, and the compliance reports, we are or we have uh, de designed fit for purpose uh, simplified application forms drawing from the community broadcasting license, as well as fit for purpose uh, and simplified uh, compliance reports drawing from the NFP and the ASP uh, frameworks, uh, those that are used by, by CA already. Uh, so it fits within their processes. So that's in an nutshell the, the recommendations around licensing for community networks. And I would like to pass it to, to my colleague, Steve Song on the recommendations about the spectrum sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, in terms of uh, you know, reaching the last mile, obviously access to radio wireless spectrum is absolutely critical. And uh, we're going to tackle it in, uh, in three different areas. So I'll talk briefly about license exempt spectrum or what we know popularly as Wi-Fi, uh, about dynamic spectrum or the TV white space regulation, and finally mobile spectrum or what uh, more formally is known as IMT or international mobile telephony spectrum. Next slide, please. So Wi-Fi uh, has been an amazing success story. It has been around since uh, about the year 2000 in terms of public access point, uh, uh, as, a, as a public access point technology. But what people may not know is that um, is, is it has also emerged as a wireless backhaul technology. Uh, and that has come much later. That's, that, uh, that started commercially around 2008. And it operates very differently. It operates in a kind of point-to-point -point, uh, character as opposed to a, a wide broadcast character. And uh, yet Wi-Fi regulation uh, uh, typically uh, only addresses it as a, as a kind of single entity. So as we looked at Wi-Fi regulations around the world, we began to see examples of regulators choosing to create two characters of license exempt regulation, one for access points, which is uh, pretty much what we see now, but a different one for point to point networks, which allow higher outputs for point to point and point to multi points. Uh, uh, um, connections and these are these are, are you know it's an amazing technology not just for community networks but for ISPs and and indeed mobile network operators. Next slide, please. So we have uh, in particular recommended that uh, that the uh, power outputs for point to point connections be reviewed and uh, aligned to to some examples of good practice around the world. And indeed, there are other license exempt bands which show tremendous potential for this kind of point to point connection, uh, such as 24 gigahertz and 60 gigahertz, which uh, offer similar kinds of potential for uh, access backhaul for, uh, for networks. And indeed, 
<clears throat> what we begin to see now is the expansion based on the success of Wi-Fi in five gigahertz uh, into uh, the six gigahertz range. And we encourage the, uh, the adoption of, of license exempt uh, regulations in this space. Um, at the same time, we, uh, you know, we think that um, that organizations using Wi-Fi technologies need to to collaborate more to to foster uh, better adherence to standards and to uh, inclusion with regulatory processes. Next slide, please. Now. Um, <clears throat> uh, a new kind of uh, spectrum management that has emerged in the last years is, is what is known as dynamic spectrum uh, regulation, which allows access to existing license bands um, in a dynamic way where they are unused. And this is most popularly uh, done with uh, what the former analog um, terrestrial broadcast frequencies for television. And so this, this regulation is known, typically known as TV white space regulation or the empty spaces where television broadcast is not happening. And that's been around, I mean, the pilots have been around since, uh, since 2013 um, but, uh, uh, but regulation in general has been slow to, to develop until recently. And indeed, the happy news is that uh, the Communications Authority have recently formally gazetted the, uh, the use of TV white space spectrum in, uh, in Kenya. However, in order to gain momentum, the uh, TV white space technology has to compete with technologies like Wi-Fi, which are growing in, in both affordability and in their potential. And so in order to, to be able to give the TV white space technology a footing uh, in the marketplace along with Wi-Fi, um, we need to see uh, very, very low barriers to the adoption um, of um, to the adoption of these technologies. Next slide, please. And so in order to do that, we, uh, we encourage the, uh, you know, the um, expeditious deployment of the geolocation database, which is needed to authenticate devices using that spectrum, but also to go a, a little bit further in terms of creating an incubatory period for TV white space technologies, which will encourage their adoption and allow them to grow a footing in the market alongside license exempt technologies. And finally, to actually look at, well, is there a way that uh, the costs might be saved by, by working through regional regulatory authorities and, and bodies to, uh, to take a common approach to the imp implementation of these geolocation databases? Next slide, please. And lastly, we come to, to IMT or mobile spectrum. And while you, know, you often see news in the, uh, in the press about spectrum scarcity and the demand for access to spectrum, the fact is that in rural areas, most spectrum lies fallow, it lies unused. And so the, the areas where we most critically need access to spectrum, there is lots of it available, but we don't have the regulatory frameworks to make it available. And what we're beginning to see around the world are new frameworks emerging that are allowing access to spectrum, to IMT, to LTE spectrum uh, in a more dynamic way. So in Mexico, uh, the regulator has set aside some spectrum specifically for social purpose use for underserved areas. And there are community networks taking advantage of that spectrum. In the United States, they have uh, developed something called the CBRS or the uh, um, Citizens, Band, uh, Citizens Broadband Radio Service, which has a, a three-tier access, which allows for both licensed and unlicensed use of the same spectrum, which is now spurring the growth of both ISBs and community networks uh, in the country. And that's operating in 3.5 gigahertz. In the United Kingdom, they have developed unique licenses uh, called a local access license and a shared access license, which allows for granular access to spectrum in both um, existing license spectrum and in spectrum that has not been assigned. And finally, in New Zealand, they have a, a very innovative program for um, uh, allowing granular access to a specific band, in this case, a 2.5 gigahertz band through what they call a managed spectrum park, which allows small operators to, to gain access to spectrum. 
Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, we've encouraged the, the establishment of a regulatory sandbox, which, which will explore localized spectrum access for small operators uh, in, uh, in unassigned LTE bands, and to review some of these examples that we've talked about uh, with a view to creating uh, an access to spectrum framework that is uh, adapted and well-suited to the, the Kenyan context. Next slide, please. But it's not just about access to spectrum. And I, you know, this point uh, uh, was raised in one of the questions and, and it's an excellent one. Uh, if spectrum access fees are, um, are withholding access to spectrum, how do we make more spectrum available in a way that's fair to everyone? So for IMT licenses, you know, millions of dollars are paid for those licenses because uh, those networks are extremely profitable and they are, they're operating yeah, in, a, in, a, in a, what is ultimately a lucrative industry. Yet, as we go out into uh, rural areas, um, the, um, the spectrum is, uh, is less profitable and we need new frameworks to, to address that. And this applies, uh, you know, for, for instance, for point-to-point -point microwave links, where the fees may be based on the number of megahertz used. Um, looking at uh, spectrum fee frameworks that recognize the need for low cost in rural areas is absolutely key. And we've also suggested that, that there, you know, perhaps nonprofit operators might have some special dispensation. Next slide, please. Now, um, as we reviewed the licensing and shared access framework and, I, and through our interviews with other operators, um, we came across issues that were outside the ambit of our consultation, but we felt had to be uh, dealt with. Next slide, please. So one is the, the cost of access to backhaul. So in this, uh, in this map here, you can see that if you have a, a community network located in, um, uh, in Northern Kenya, they may be able to access very low cost Wi-Fi backhaul technology to connect to a point of presence but the cost of getting from that point of presence to, uh, to Nairobi and indeed to the rest of the world um, may be unsustainable. And the further away you are from, uh, from Nairobi, the higher the cost of backhaul is. And this is an absolutely critical limiting factor for the delivery of affordable rural access. Next slide, please. So accordingly, um, we've recommended that, um, that wholesale operators should publish a reference access off, uh, offer in order to ensure access transparency and non-discrimination. Uh, what we've heard from some, uh, some operators is that there is a substantial variance in, uh, in uh, access prices that are quoted for, uh, for fiber backhaul. Um, and the normative process of publishing a reference access officer uh, reference access offer uh, is um, well understood and well used in, in, uh, within, uh, in West Africa, in, uh, in Botswana, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it, we think that, um, that it will encourage the, the normalization of market costs. And finally, um, as Grace mentioned er uh, earlier, access to universal service funds, uh, this is undergoing a separate process within uh, CA's consultations, but uh, we believe that, um, that community networks should have some access within those funds to catalyze the, the growth of those networks. And, uh, and that brings us to, uh, to the end of our presentation. Next slide. Uh, I would just leave you with this, uh, with this message, which is based on the, or is on the, on the side of a, a university in, the, uh, in Belgium and the University of Ghent, which is the next big thing will be a lot of small things. And we believe that by emp empowering small network operators, community networks, we will see significant change. Thank you. Thank you very much to Josephine, to Carlos and to Steve. As you can tell, there's quite a bit of work that went on into the project. Uh, Josephine has shared sort of that whole background and the examples of the community networks and, and how the very heart of what those community networks are is basically community-based community organizations that seek to uplift the local community, seek to create access opportunities. In other words, decrease the sort of disenfranchisement that currently happens with 
um, sort of local communities in different rural parts of the countries, which are tagged as unserved or underserved areas. Um, as a matter of fact, I think since the first, the first community broadcasting organization, I dare say this was Mangalete Community Broadcasting Entity, which um, I think 18 years ago was perhaps the sort of first community-based organization. And this was before the Kenya Information and Communications Act. Uh, but, but speaking to how even at that time, I think the CA was very interested in ensuring that there's some level of fairness or equitability that can be passed to these organizations. Um, you've noted the very far reaching recommendations that have been made uh, both in the licensing context and the frequency um, spectrum context, which context, which perhaps leads me to, uh, to say that perhaps since unified licensing framework in 2004, um, the success of this project and the outcome of this project perhaps will lead to um, a very robust change in licensing and frequency spectrum in this country, the like of which we haven't seen for many years. And I think this will only be for the betterment of the country. But um, enough said, um, it's time to hear from the CA. I'm going to ask Mr. I think Crispin Ogongo may not be with us, but I'll ask Mr. Gababo Wako to speak on behalf of licensing and also frequency spectrum. And then hopefully after that, we can move on to the panel discussion, the more exciting part of things. Thank you. Mr. Tom Olwero, sorry, were you going to come in? Uh, my apologies, I did see you had unmuted. Um, and and if, you're not, if you're going to go through, then perhaps that's fine. Uh, but otherwise, um, over Chair, to you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just Thank you. wanted to add that uh, Mr. Dennis Sonoya would also be able to assist Mr. Gababo Wako on this area of insight into the regulatory plan of action. Thank you, Chair. Very well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, much appreciated. So over to you, Mr. Wako and Mr. Sonoya, in whichever order you please, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kip. Uh, I wish to, my name is Gababo Wako, I work for Communication Authority of Kenya. The, I wish to talk about uh, the plan of action we have. So in terms of, uh, this has already been talked about in detail. So in brief, in terms of the licensing, what we are looking in the near term is to introduce a new license category for community networks within uh, the unified licensing framework. This is the process that is currently underway to facilitate access of ICT services uh, by underserved communities. The, as, as you are aware, the ULF enables technology and service neutral uh, licensing. The, the ULF market is structured into three licenses. The first is the NFP, Network Facilities Provider, who own and operate any form of uh, infrastructure. Uh, the second is ASP. These mainly, mainly provide all forms of services to end users. And the third is a content service provider license, which basically provides content services such as broadcast. Then further, the uh, NFP license, uh, network facilities provider license, is structured into three. It's tier one, which has national coverage, tier two as regional coverage, and tier three as uh, uh, covers mainly districts. So we are we 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 are going we are proposing to introduce a, a new license category, uh, which consists of all the three uh, main licenses: the NFP, ASP, and uh, CSP, merged into one. This mainly to ensure that uh, the financial, the fees, and the administrative reporting process are uh, commensurate with the, their scope and scale. And the second uh, plan of action that uh, we have is to enable, to expand the license exempt spectrum. License spectrum, the license exempt spectrum is a shared spectrum in form of Wi-Fi and operates on an interference and protected basis and is uh, widely used by consumers and service providers. So in terms of uh, enabling, expanding the use of license exempt, we are going to, we plan to review the guidelines on the use of spectrum 
for short range devices, mainly to amend uh, the, uh, the power limits for 2.4 and 5 gig to enable wider coverage. The second uh, action is to review the options for lowering uh, the barrier to use of other uh, Wi-Fi uh, spectrum and also introduce additional license spectrum, mainly in 24 gigahertz and 60 gigahertz. For the six gigahertz band, we plan to extend the use of the band uh, to the lower six gig between 59.25 to 64.25. This is a discussion that is ongoing globally and some countries have already ex expanded that band for wide channel use, mainly for Wi-Fi 6 based technology. Uh, we are also involved in discussion within African Telecom Union to now harmonize uh, in Africa the use of uh, the six, the lower six year hat band for use by Wi-Fi, while also protecting the incumbent services. This uh, recommendation has already been uh, adopted and uh, is undergoing the final approval process within ATU. Uh, the third is uh, TV white space. Uh, I think this has already been talked about. The, in the medium term, we are also looking at uh, developing a shared spectrum framework for underutilized IMT spectrum bands. This is meant to make available that spectrum on shared basis in areas uh, where the spectrum is unused in a dynamic way. Uh, the other activity that we also plan to look at is uh, review of the spectrum free, uh, spectrum charging methodology. Uh, we recognize that there is need to reduce fees for uh, certain underserved uh, areas. So in summary, the, the, those are a few uh, areas that we are going to address as, uh, as we move forward. So I wish to hand over to my colleague, Sonoya. As your colleague comes in, um, Gababo, uh, I'd just like to also request you, perhaps also Noya, to speak to the licensing aspects. You've done quite a bit on the spectrum, but if you could also speak to the licensing aspects of the, the proposals. Thank you. Yes, I Thank think you. that uh, is, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah continue, Sonoya. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kipton. So with regards to the licensing, it's, uh, for this to be clear, we need to understand that the unified licensing framework, as Gababo has mentioned and previously indicated in the presentation, uh, caters for a variety of licenses and license categories. And it is important that any review that is conducted uh, is done under the wider scope of the impact, the proposed addition of one operator category has on the rest of the framework. So as I mentioned earlier, we are expecting uh, that the, the consultation on the review of the ULF to take place later in the year. And uh, this the community network uh, licensing proposal, that is the community network service provider license category will be addressed at, at length in that forum as well. So I would not expect that we see this in the prism of only a favor favorable treatment simply for CN, but that the entire wider in ULF is currently under review. And uh, at no point will anyone be disenfranchised or any other license category to not be disenfranchised by any addition or removal or perceived leniency in terms of licensing requirements. I think, uh, is that clear? Thank you. Thank you, thank so, you very much, Alicia. Yes. I think Gababu has answered the, or has uh, gone through the, provided the relevant insight into the regulatory framework on how we want to achieve this in, within the near, medium, and the sort of timelines. And we expect that consultations will continue. At no point does it indicate that this is the last consultation on this matter. We would expect a further consultation. We have seen some chat questions in the Q&A regarding the spectrum fee schedule and how it may disenfranchise some operator with sort of, uh, so, but this may not, this is sort of premature and we'll be posting a response to that maybe at the end of the session with regards to uh, addressing that specific question. Because I think someone is preempting litigation on that. Quite unnecessary at this stage. So I think Kababu has adequately covered the issues. I'd like to pause back to Mr. Oluero at this time. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Luero, um, would, would there be anything to add to what your team has already covered? Um, if you could just let us know, otherwise uh, we can move on. Uh, as you'll have noticed from what has been mentioned by Gababo and Dennis, there's, there's already quite a bit of work that's ongoing with regard to addressing some of the challenges that were picked up by the consultancy. Um, a, a lot of gratifying work I'm, I might have to add, and obviously one of the more significant ones without meaning to belittle any of the others is, is spectrum fee reduction, which has been um, a very big deal and has been a, a point of pain for you know, CBOs, CNs um, in that space. Um, it is also very welcoming to note that uh, the CA, perhaps you know, almost uh, 16, 17 years down the line is you know, looking at a wholesome review of unified, the unified licensing framework, uh, which at the time it was introduced was um, necessary, absolutely necessary for the industry. And I think it's um, overdue that we have a whole relook at the unified licensing framework, which certainly, um, as, as, as Dennis said, um, ought to benefit or not to disenfranchise any single licensee who's already licensed. Now, um, let's move on to um, something else. Let's have a panel discussion. Um, and in the panel discussion, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, my friends, Barak Otieno. Um, it's a pleasure to have you um, on the panel, Barak. Um, and I noticed that um, you're associated with Aheri um, amongst the multitude of things that, that you do within the internet society in Kenya. So welcome, Barak. Uh, you will go first. And then after that, we shall have Mwangi, Mwangi Mishuki. Um, it's a pleasure to see you again, Mwangi Mishuki. Um, uh, thank you for uh, joining the, the panel. Uh, you know, you'll talk on behalf of the Internet Society. And of course, um, it's a pleasure to welcome Alice Munua from the Mozilla Foundation. Um, it will be absolutely excellent to hear from you. Um, and as Gigi said earlier, it's a pleasure to see all of you again um, still doing things within the sector. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. So over to you, Barak. Let's start with you and then we can move to the other two panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and uh, colleagues for this opportunity to speak. Indeed, I wear many hats, and uh, for this uh, specific meeting, I'll be speaking on behalf of AHERI, which stands for Africa Higher Education Research Institute. Uh, but in Kisumu, AHERI has a connotation of love. Uh, so many things uh, under different concepts. Uh, I will speak briefly, Africa Higher Education Research Institute started way back in 2010 as a project under a, a non-governmental organization known as Community Initiative Support Services. Uh, my colleague, uh, Robert Rodera, who is the executive director is also on the call and uh, will be sharing some links that are, rele that are relevant to those that are following. And uh, CIS or Community Initiative Support Services uh, has been operating in the areas of environmental management, uh, livelihoods and uh, health for many years, as I've mentioned. Uh, it has community centers in Kisumu, uh, in uh, Siaya and in Homa Bay. And uh, basically the Aheri community, the Aheri Digital Village and Community Network Initiative was built on uh, already existing infrastructure that had been established by Community Initiative Support Services. Let me also say that uh, Community Initiative Support Services support is, supports over 200 uh, women and youth groups across the three counties that I have mentioned. And uh, so it gave us uh, quite an easy time when uh, it came to establishing uh, the pilot phase of the Aheri Digital Village and Community a network initiative. Uh, but a bit of background, um, uh, AHERI in itself is a research institution that focuses on uh, higher education. And uh, our interest or the interest in community networks came in a conference that was held in 2019 at the Tom Boyer Labor College in Kisumu. And uh, our colleague uh, who is also on this call, Matogoro Jabera from the University of Dodoma made a presentation on community networks. Uh, he made a paper and there was a feeling that uh, uh, it was an interesting idea uh, to try out at that particular time. So we embarked on a series of consultations and visits to the other community networks in Kenya that were mentioned earlier. Uh, specifically, we had engagements with Tunapanda Networks, which is a pioneer community network in Kibra. 
consulted them and saw what they were doing. Uh, we had an engagement with our colleagues from Lanet Community Networks, and uh, I have seen uh, Irene uh, Misoy as well, just to try and understand uh, what did they do that we could learn from them, uh, given our unique context. Uh, I think as uh, uh, listening or following the conversation, I've seen that uh, uh, the proposal or the suggestion is to limit the community network within a sub county. Uh, but again, we present an interesting scenario where we are operating across three counties. And then when you look at, uh, for instance, Western Kenya, uh, let me take the example of Kisumu, for example. Uh, if you drive for 55 kilometers, you are not even 55. If you drive for 20 kilometers, you are in Vihiga County. If you go for another 55, you're in Kakamega. Uh, you do another, another maybe uh, 60, you are in Busia. So you can see that the borders are really narrow. And uh, our experience is as we have um, uh, introduced the digital villages and community networks to the community, you find that there are community members who request whether it is possible to bring it closer uh, to where they are. And sometimes it means transversing county boundaries. So even as we have this conversation, uh, it's important to look at some of those realities that are on the ground. Uh, currently, we have a community uh, innovation center at a place called Akala, which is on the Kisumu Bondo Road, uh, which was our first site and our anchor site. And basically, uh, our facility consists of, um, uh, of um, um, a center with uh, between four to 10 computers. Uh, we have a community server where there is content uh, that contains a lot of information on health and uh, development related information. And then the infrastructure that we use also acts as a Wi-Fi hotspot. So for community members that typically come to meet at the community centers that have been established by our parent organization, they can be able to access uh, Wi-Fi or the internet with different devices uh, within, the, within the, the premises that we have our community centers in. We also do have um, another facility in uh, just next to Siaya town at a place called Nia, where Community Initiative service, uh, Support Services has a demonstration center where local community members are taught uh, kitchen gardening, uh, there's a honey refinery at the same place, so community members meet regularly uh, to be taught uh, kitchen gardening, uh, conversations uh, related to health, uh, conversations related to agricultural practices, and we've also provided a facility there. And the other facility is at a place called Omuga. Uh, Omuga is uh, in Homa Bay County at a place called Kabondo. Uh, in this particular place, we installed uh, the facility at a technical and vocational institution. Initially, when we did the installation, the facility had about uh, 250 students, uh, but right now enrollment has soared to about 500. So uh, there's about a computer lab with 12 computers, and um, uh, we facilitated uh, kitting and connection of the lab and provision of Wi-Fi. Having said that, we have faced a lot of challenges on the ground. Uh, one of them is um, our infrastructure uh, relies largely on 4G. And uh, most of the listeners may have seen the conversations around 4G fair usage policies. So you find that, uh, for instance, if we used to buy uh, 50 GB, uh, it is not the same thing that we had in January 2020 or uh, November 2019, uh, around the time when we were starting our initiative, you find that after a certain um, uh, threshold, uh, the bandwidth is uh, there's throttling, and it goes back to say one MB. The other thing is uh, in the when the COVID-19 pandemic was on and the facilities were not being used, there were cases in which uh, the SIM cards you find they are deleted, uh, and um, when we try to engage the service operators, you find that it's a very complicated process. It means going up the roofs and uh, changing SIM cards in the radios. And to say the least, uh, the model has proved to be very challenging. 
Uh, the other uh, observation we have made is that uh, while in town uh, we can afford to be topping up 100 shillings every other time, uh, in the village context, 100 shilling means a lot. I mean, it's the difference between someone uh, having dinner or going hungry. So we've had to do a lot of training uh, and uh, just trying to articulate the internet value chain uh, to the community so that they see a sense in why they should invest uh, in, uh, in uh, or rather in connectivity for lack of a better word and why they should use the internet. So sustainability has been something that uh, is a major challenge. Uh, we have also observed that um, uh, it's important to use local resources. And when I say local resources, local youth, uh, we have invested a lot in training and um, we are doing a lot of training uh, in our offices in Kisumu where we train local youth. Some of them were electricians or those who have come from the TVETs uh, just to make sure that they are the ones doing the connection, that they're the ones uh, doing the maintenance. Of course, when uh, the community sees that um, uh, there are youth uh, that they know or members of the community, then they also embrace uh, the internet or they, they embrace community connectivity in a different way. Finally, I would say that uh, we have also realized that without partnerships, it's very difficult to run community networks. Uh, let me say that uh, community networks, uh, of course, are not purely uh, profit driven, but at the same time, bandwidth has to be paid for. Uh, you find that uh, even when you connect community members, they expect quality connectivity. They don't want, they don't just want connectivity for the sake of connectivity, but they want quality connectivity that will enable them to access government services. If it is e-government, that will enable them to access um, uh, other government services like help, like a lot of questions we receive from the TVET that we've connected is they can't access help pages, especially when it's time when the students need to apply for loans and facilities like those. Uh, and we realized that co with COVID, the demand for, um, for digital goods has even gone higher. You find that people want to, the appetite to access the internet has really increased. And you find that at times uh, it's, you can't be able to charge them for what it's worth. So we really have to find the right balance or a model uh, that is suitable for the community. So we are talking with uh, various operators uh, just to try and see whether there can be affordable and decent packages that can help us serve the community in a better way. So partnerships we've realized are very key. Um, uh, partnerships with government. Uh, and I want to thank uh, CA most sincerely uh, for responding to this uh, need that is timely. Uh, by facilitating this action. We've had partnerships with organizations like the Internet Society, uh, which have actually boosted our efforts to connect the, con the community. I must say that in Kisumu, we have, um, uh, uh, we have four public hotspots. Uh, we have two active ones, uh, one at Dunga Beach, uh, one at Nalenda Informal Settlements, and uh, we see an average of 100 people daily using those public hotspots to access the internet. And most of them are small scale traders. And um, uh, we, we've, uh, we are serving them within what we can be able to afford. But I must say that uh, what we are doing uh, is really a timely initiative. And um, again, as I, I wind up, I would like to point out that we've also noticed that uh, even with community networks, it's important to have clear business models. Sustainability is a major challenge. In the rural areas, power is also a major issue. We've lost a lot of equipment because of brownouts, uh, sometimes lightning strikes, uh, because many buildings you find that uh, probably have been put up and the owners probably did not afford to have lightning arrest us. So when we go out to serve the community, you find that we have to go out of the way to actually uh, make uh, most of the buildings internet ready. Uh, but again, all is not lost. I would say that we are soldiering on. 
uh, with uh, partnerships and uh, with uh, a lot of research that is happening. And we hope that uh, with those little or many efforts, we'll be able to make a different. Uh, we'll be able to make a difference uh, in the lives of the unserved and uh, in the lives of those that are underserved within the community. I'll stop there at now, as at now, and come back later in case of any questions and reactions, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barak. That's very insightful in terms of what's actually happening with the CNs and your participation in them. Um, I'm still not convinced about uh, the acronym Maheri. It seems to be, it was devised around the Nyanza region, but uh, enough said about that. Mishuki, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kiptiness. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Amichuki Mwangi. I am the Senior Director for Internet Technology and Development at the Internet Society. It's a pleasure and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us um, this afternoon to be here with you. I'd like first to just um, take the opportunity to <clears throat> congratulate, um, I think, the um, CA and also uh, the partners that they've been working with at APC, uh, Kicktonet, uh, University of Strathclyde and UK Aid for this, uh, what I would like to call a really uh, incredible milestone and project um, for a number of reasons. So um, first and foremost, um, maybe just before I go into the reasons that I would like to talk about today, I just want to just mention that for those who don't know about the Internet Society, uh, we are an organization that's uh, working for an open and globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet for all. Um, we have global members, um, you know, and they comprise of organizations, uh, individual members, uh, partners, and chapters. And I would like to recognize that we have a Kenyan ISOC chapter uh, that has been doing some um, really good work in the industry. And we hope that um, they will also be involved in this process and uh, at least are playing a role in this process to support the development of community networks. And I do know that because some of the members, I think I've seen someone like Tohir uh, posting in, in questions here and a few others, um, they, they are very keen on this. And um, one of the areas that we have been working on is uh, the development of community networks. This started some years back with some effort in India, in Asia Pacific region, uh, where we uh, had very good successes with some partners, um, the Digital um, Foundation, I forget the middle uh, name, or rather DF, um, and they've been really helpful in trying to develop community networks in, in India and other parts of Asia Pacific. And we've seen this uh, transforming into a very strong movement and uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, which I think is important is uh, uh, given the process that uh, this has taken is trying to address the policy challenges that makes it difficult for community networks uh, to, to emerge, to grow and be successful. So I'll take a step back and go through uh, some of the milestones that we've seen uh, you know, taking place over the, uh, the last few years. Um, there's been a mention of the work that we've been doing uh, with respect to the development of community networks. Um, if you read the report, you will see a mention of the community network summit that has taken place a couple of times the last five years. Two of those events have, uh, have been organized here in Kenya, and we've seen some traction resulting from that. But on the policy side, um, I'd like to go back to some of the work uh, which um, has led to uh, um, a declaration that was um, issued uh, in 2019 in Sharm el-Sheikh um, through the African Union Specialized Technical Committee on Communications and Information Technology or STC CITC, which basically recognized the role uh, of community networks and actually encouraged their member states to form um, strategy and initiate pilot projects to try and unlock the access to basic infrastructure, especially for people in rural and underserved areas. And uh, we, we see this as really um, the next step 
uh, in terms of the effort that Kenya is taking as the next step leading to actualizing or implementing those recommendations that came from uh, the, the, um, the third meeting of the SDC. And why is this important? Um, basically, the importance is that for progress to be achieved in terms of for us to reach scale, then the barriers need to, to, to sort of be eliminated. And you know, for most of us who come from Kenya, you'll understand um, one of my most, um, you know, um, I'll say analogy that I use is on water projects. Uh, we've, as a country, it, you know, uh, piped water is not available everywhere. But uh, uh, water borehole projects uh, or community-based water borehole projects have actually gone a long way in trying to bring piped water to many of the communities in rural areas. Um, and so I draw that analogy into what community networks really are trying to do. It's trying to, you know, as um, um, to try and bring connectivity to areas where it is much harder for the large operators or the existing models uh, to try and bring connectivity to those areas for various uh, reasons. And mostly they do so through the, the model that they they're established, which is community bottom-up uh, type of approach. And we've seen this working fairly well. Uh, I think I will not repeat what uh, Josephine uh, has covered with the examples uh, from Uganda with Bosco. But also importantly is to recognize that other countries in Africa, like um, Uganda as well, our neighboring country, has also made some efforts to try and recognize um, the role of community networks and created a licensing framework um, that actually makes it easier for community networks to register, uh, to, to rather be, uh, to um, get licenses to be able to operate. Uh, this year, we've also seen some uh, positive progress in Zimbabwe, where they uh, made a review of the existing policy and regulation uh, to allow um, uh, for the the use of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz for community uh, community br uh, broadband services for rural areas and as a sub uh, consequence of that we were working parallel with um, a community network in a rural place called buhera in, in buhera district called murambinda and they launched their first community network in in zimbabwe last week on friday uh, the minister was there for the launch and all of these are coming in the you know um, um, in in hindsight and uh, at the backdrop of these policy changes, which allowed for pilots to take place. And then it made it possible uh, for these community networks to now start operating because now they can apply for licensing. One thing which I really want to uh, sort of emphasize a little bit on is the issue of scaling. I think it's important for us to realize that um, the startup process of community networks and for us to actually see meaningful um, impact is by having more of these community networks. Um, I think the last, last slide that uh, Steve Song put up uh, the, uh, that showed that you know, the, the next beast thing will be a lot of small things. Um, so in, in looking at that picture means that we need to have a lot of small community networks all over, you know, and so that we can actually, um, you know, see a dent in, in, in connecting the number of people who are unconnected. But the issue is how do we make them come into existence? How do we support them to exist, to come in, to bootstrap them? And we know one of the big issues is funding. So we need to find strategic ways to actually help uh, fund these community networks, bootstrap them. The organizations, APC, uh, Internet Society, and others that are actually trying that, but we need to do this at scale. Otherwise, it's not going to be possible. It's very difficult for community networks in their way, their structure to go to a bank and get funding to get bootstrapped. So we need to come up with some innovative ways to get them um, bootstrapped or started up. The other thing is, um, and this, this is going to be important, is that the role that they play in developing the market, wherever they are, is key. Um, so we've, we've said that, you know, we'll create community networks um, in rural areas, but how do we get the people in that area to actually start using the internet uh, or using that infrastructure to improve their livelihood, to have an impact, to benefit from that infrastructure? So 
there's going to be a lot of the capacity building that is needed, a lot of work that needs to go into developing those communities to take advantage of that infrastructure. And to do that, um, you know, we'll need to do uh, capacity building. There are certain roles that we we'll need to um, go into the community to just make strategic interventions that will really lead to more innovation, um, more uptake uh, by the people in that area so that they can use it to complement or advance what they're already doing in, in, in from a social economic standpoint. And then they will actually realize the full benefit of having that infrastructure. So that's a key component. And we have to think about it more strategically, uh, whether it's bringing the academicians, uh, the universities to work with every, you know, all the key stakeholders so that we can see how to explore this. And, you know, um, one of the things which I really appreciate is the kind of approaches that we've done as a country in the innovation around M-Pesa. You know, we opened it up. We really didn't put a lot of restrictions and allowed all the stakeholders to come in and play a role. And that has really led to the explosion of the use of M-Pesa um, as a value add, as a transactional mechanism, as a way of paying things uh, for, for every goods and services and so on. So community networks, it's pretty much the infrastructure getting to that edge. And now then we need to really put our minds around how do we create innovation around the infrastructure to support the people living in those communities. Uh, finally, um, I just want to uh, quickly touch on some of the commitments that we are making as organizations and stakeholders in this, um, I would like to uh, mention, for instance, we are developing a community networks handbook, which will be really key in talking about um, how do we scale this issue? Because to scale, it means you're going to the rural areas and getting the communities to organize, self-organize and build, operate a community network. I mentioned about the water projects that we all know, the community water projects. How do they actually become sustainable? How We know some have failed, but a, a good percentage of them have actually worked. So what has led them to be successful? It's the interventions that have been made in developing these communities to self-organize and run the project in a manner that's more likely to be successful and sustainable. So we need to do the same thing. And so the, our input and contribution to this process will be a handbook that will help the, um, the stakeholders involved in working with these communities to get uh, those communities at a certain level of readiness and be successful. We'll suddenly continue doing the capacity building that we've done over the past. And we are also looking at uh, supporting the infrastructure development that we've done and uh, also continue to provide the platform where uh, these community networks can come and share, uh, collaborate, share experiences, learn from each other, uh, through the annual summits that we've been organizing with our partners, who are some of them are here. And also um, look, continue to conduct research and, uh, you know, seeing how best to improve that ecosystem, because it's an ecosystem of its own. So identifying what are the gaps, uh, you know, what, what do policymakers need to do in terms of interventions? What are other areas that um, need to, you know, be developed so that this can continue to be successful? And finally, of course, uh, we will certainly keep uh, engaging with the policymakers and regulators to make sure that um, you know this this space is given um, sort of the right attention and the interventions that are made really remove the barriers. And I just want to conclude by congratulating the CA for really taking this initiative because I think it's a strategic one. It's important, and we will certainly help in making those uh, important uh, milestones of getting more people connected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mishuki. Um, uh, very, very succinct and uh, germane points that you've raised there um, around bootstrapping, finding a way to help to bootstrap these community networks, um, in ensuring their strategic interventions so that they can actually make the right decisions as to how to grow. Um, and, and, and the handbook that you mentioned for community networks should be very helpful, as you said, in helping them you know, deal with scale, but basically providing a Bible that would allow community networks to walk that well-beaten path without making the mistakes that perhaps the early participants would have made. So, so thank you for that, Mishuki. That's uh, very helpful in building up the discussion. 
Now over to you, Alice. Um, thank you for dialing in. Um, you've been at this for a good minute now, and um, clearly there's a lot that you can say that would help us around this project that um, we're undertaking jointly with this year. Welcome, Alice. Um, first off, uh, thank you very, very much, and good evening, everybody. It's it's super early in the morning for me here. It's uh, five. 47 a.m. But I'm really, really grateful uh, to, to have been invited and uh, really great to be here. Uh, impressed by the evolution of uh, internet. Uh, congratulations, Gigi. Really great to see it moving to a think tank and also really congratulate uh, the communications authority. Uh, I think I still believe it's still one of the most progressive regulatory authorities that have ever served. Uh, and thanking uh, all the organizers for inviting Mozilla uh, and congratulating you all for this milestone and this project. And really good to hear uh, Michuki that ISOC is going to be working on a handbook uh, to provide you know, additional support and ongoing support for community networks because this discussion has been ongoing for really quite a, a number of years. So for those who don't know, um, Alice Munua, I work uh, with Mozilla. Um, you know, very briefly, Mozilla, Mozilla, I work for the corporation, not the foundation, uh, although the foundation owns the corporation fully. Um, but the corporation is the one that actually does a lot of the uh, innovation work and public policy work out there, while the corporation does much more of the advocacy related uh, sort of work. Um, and, you know, um, Mozilla itself is a global, it's really a vibrant global community with a mission to promote openness, innovation and opportunity on the web. Um, and we are known for the popular web browser Firefox. Uh, we build products that put people back in control of their connected lives and advocate for public policies that improve the health of the internet. And how do we do this? It's by creating and promoting interoperable open standards enabling innovation um, and advancing the web as a platform that is open and accessible to all. Uh, within Mozilla Corporation, I lead um, the Africa MRADI or the Africa Innovation Program, which is a pan-Mozillan, both a foundation and a corporation in initiative uh, that really aims at catalyzing uh, innovation for community, for and with communities in the Africa region. It's only uh, this program itself is only about six months old or seven months old. We launched it uh, in August last year. Uh, and what I'm doing right currently is working with uh, African entrepreneurs, intergovernmental organizations, you know, policymakers and others to support solutions that best address the intersection of um, internet health priorities and real world internet, internet uh, user needs in the Africa region. So why is Mozilla you know, uh, interested in this? Um, because Mozilla started in 1998 uh, when the future of the internet really looked rather bleak. Uh, for those who remember, Microsoft was on a war path to monopolize the internet uh, with proprietary tech uh, that could only be opened in its own uh, internet uh, uh, explorer browser. So Mozilla emerged as a clear opponent to this, aiming to ensure balance um, an open and free internet accessible to all. And what we did was to set uh, principles in the form of a manifesto with a firm commitment to values like privacy, interoperability, free and open source software, and a balance between commercial, public profit benefits, and also right, you know, uh, focusing on, on what you know, co the community and community networks uh, specifically for this instance could do. So our browser Firefox has actually long held the distinction of being one of the most popular browser that is not really managed or, you know, by a huge corporation. And as you know, for those who really do know Mozilla, we've spent the last several years fighting harder and louder than ever, you know, for the future or, you know, of the internet in an open accessible way in quotes to ensure that it remains accessible and fair. So what is really being proposed here is really wonderful because it's progress towards what we, you know, we consider universal affordable access to the internet. And we know that internet growth has been really slow uh, because, you know, connecting, especially less uh, underserved and rural areas is still not profitable for big operators. You know, so the need for complementary business and sustainability models so that we are able to connect everyone. So, and community networks, uh, nonprofit operators, owned by communities they serve are proving to be super viable approach uh, in filling those access and connectivity gaps. 
So um, I agree with all of you that we need to lower the barriers uh, to community networks operation uh, with regulation that must be oriented towards, um, you know, um, more modest operator licenses, um, you know, because currently, you know, the operator licenses are still pretty expensive in, bo in both in cost and in time and expertise for community networks to, uh, to maintain. And that's why it's so important uh, you know, for that capacity building that Michuki was talking about uh, to, uh, to start and to continue and to be sustainable in the longer term. And also the need for a simpler licensing framework with lower fees and lower compliance requirements is super important. Um, you know, acknowledging that community networks typically use Wi-Fi to connect, uh, but you know, which Wi-Fi is, is wonderful, but uh, it has its limitations. So the need for a more flexible and affordable framework uh, for access to spectrum, especially in rural areas, and also acknowledging uh, that backhaul is another, you know, as Steve mentioned, uh, a very big and ongoing cost for small operators. Um, and so fiber operators should publish, for example, a, you know, a basic reference access offer as part of their licensing obligation. Uh, and also community networks should be supported uh, through uh, the universal fund like uh, Gigi mentioned. So, you know, in general, you know, equitable access uh, to the internet for all is core uh, part of our mission. Uh, and our manifesto, you know, acknowledges and is committed to an internet that includes all people of the earth. So where a person's demographic characteristics do not necessarily determine their online access or the opportunities they have or the quality of experience that they, that, that, that they get while accessing the internet. And for these community networks can foster that affordable access and promote uh, that level of inclusion. Um, we also believe that the internet is a public resource and must be open and accessible to all. And much has been said about open and transparency in digital resources, but we don't hear much said about transparency with regard to, for example, physical infrastructure, which underpin the internet. So whether it's the fiber optic cables or it's wireless spectrum or it's towers. So while it's really great to hear the recommendations rega regarding uh, transparency on fiber networks, uh, Mozilla has been working with the World Bank and the International Telecommunications Union, uh, and we launched uh, an initiative that aims to bring open data uh, transparency to, uh, to fiber optic uh, network infrastructure. So, uh, and the CA actually joined uh, the World Bank and the ITU last month when we announced uh, this uh, collaboration. And the intention here is to develop for describing um, uh, fiber optic networks, which will allow regulators and operators uh, to um, share network data uh, to a common standard, which will facilitate data collection, information sharing, as well as management and research activity, you know, because the internet is just too important an asset to be left, you know, in the dark or without that level of transparency. And as Mozilla, we are really committed to supporting more openness uh, and public access to information around telecommunications infrastructure and telecommunication infrastructure development for that matter. So uh, Mozilla's Africa Mradi uh, is now supporting uh, innovation and entrepreneurship on the continent. But we also know that entrepreneurs are not just individuals. So, uh, and when people work together, you know, communities can innovate and become entrepreneurial uh, to invest in health and other and other areas and the growth. I mean, you know, other areas especially that com contribute to the growth of their communities. And as Michuki mentioned. How do we, you know, a really good question is how do we get folks in these communities to benefit from community infrastructure? Uh, so there's a lot that is needed to support uh, the communities to lead much more, you know, so that it can lead to much more innovation and uptake uh, to use community networks uh, and, uh, and also the need to bootstrap them, you know, so that they are able to contribute to the growth of that community socially, um, uh, economically, um, you know, even politically. 
So our, our manifesto notes that the internet must enrich the lives of individual human beings, but the individuals must have the ability to shape that in, the, the internet itself and their own experiences on it. So for me and for Mozilla, community networks speak to the heart of, of innovation and entrepreneurship by encouraging communities to invest in themselves uh, with new and affordable access to technologies. And with this proposal, you know, proposed regulation, um, you know, for community networks, Mozilla hopes to see a wave of innovation in access models uh, with communities leading the way. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I might, I'll need to drop off at the top of the hour, but Steve Song, um, who works uh, with, with Mozilla with me, uh, can respond to any questions regarding Mozilla, you know, going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to hear from you. And uh, we certainly take your statement um, that the CA is a very open and, um, and, and very participatory regulator. Um, and, and for those that are not aware, Alice is, Alice is a former director on the board of, of the CA. And so we well, thank you very much. Although I have to add, Alice, before you drop off, clearly the years have been kind to you and like uh, Mishiki and myself who look uh, very weather bitten, but uh, have a good morning. And uh, thank you for taking your time to attend this with us. Now thank you we're going to thank you very much. Now we're going to go into sort of QA, even though since the session started, we've had quite a number of questions. Um, in fact, we've had I think about uh, 15 questions um, and most have been answered. Actually there's just two open questions. Um, um, I, I'd like to give an opportunity to any of the panelists um, out of the questions that have been responded to. If there's any questions that perhaps you needed to add value to, because I wouldn't want us in view of um, time having run so fast to re-answer the question. So but what I will do is I'll ask any of the um, panelists um, who may wish to add value to some of those questions. A lot of them uh, have been around policy um, issues. Um, some of them have had to do with uh, more substantive issues around cost and you know what CA will be doing going forward. But um, is there any panelist who wishes to answer, add value to any questions that they answered? And specifically, the three questions that are left, we have three questions, one from, uh, there's an anonymous attendee. Um, we have not dismissed any question, uh, but uh, it would have been good to know who the anonymous attendee is, but there's one question from anonymous attendee, uh, which is what are the key differences between the ULF and the converged licensing framework? He says, I see CA using ULF, whereas TCRA uses CLF. Um, so I believe that, that could be a fairly straightforward question that um, perhaps Dennis, you could, you could take. Tuahir has also asked a question, or is it more of a comment? He says, CN can be equate, equated to those water boreholes dotted in the countryside, borrowing from Barak, reflecting on the poverty of the rural areas. Can we expect corporates, for example, Mozilla, Huawei to step in in bringing up a model CN. So this is a question addressed to the corporates, specifically Mozilla and Huawei, uh, whether they would be um, participating in helping to bring bring up a model CN. And I think this is a very deliberate question in view of um, what those entities do. Uh, perhaps you can have Dennis go for the first answer. Um, Barak, we'll come back to you if you don't mind in a minute. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's an echo. So thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. So with regard to the key issue uh, raised by the anonymous attendees regarding the Tanzanian model and the Kenyan model, you may find that different uh, regulatory jurisdictions and adopt any framework that they see fit. So really it's not a matter of comparison of which regulator has adopted a better framework. It, the objective is really the same to achieve universal access to ICT services. So usually under the East African Communications Organization, the member states and organizations work to go on together to work towards having a harmonized sort of regional approach to licensing matters. Of course, under the African Telecommunications Union and the wider International Telecommunications Union as well, so a lot of best practices have been ad adopted and have been traded across the various countries. I would not wish to go through in detail and say what are the pros and cons of either, but it, 
clearly may be a matter of denotation of the unified licensing framework versus convergence uh, proposed by TCRA. So thank you. Thank you for that, Dennis. Uh, are we able to get a response from Steve uh, and the question addressed to Mozilla? Maybe before Steve. Can, yes, Gababo, can I... proceed. Go ahead, go ahead, Gababo. Just to add to what uh, Dennis mentioned, uh, ULF uh, is, of course, uh, in the old uh, the traditional licenses, the licenses were based on technology. For example, there were licenses for GSMA, CDMA, VSAT, fixed landlines, and such. Uh, then in terms of uh, services, so licenses uh, were based on particular services. So there were licenses for providing voice, providing uh, internet or GMPCS and such. But with the advancement of uh, technology, so there is a convergence, mainly between uh, mobile, internet and fixed services. So convergence of services resulted in, uh, for example, sin a single network carrying all the services. So you didn't need to have fixed, it you have to have GSMA, uh, voice or internet. So you had one network that carries all services, uh, one device that uh, receives uh, all the services uh, and such. So basically uh, the framework is similar. So it's just in terms of looking at uh, convergence and also looking at the unifying aspect of the those uh, technologies and services so in terms of the implementation they are just similar but it, 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 the difference is just using the terminology that is being used thank you all right uh thank you for that added clarification gababo uh, steve do you have a quick response i'd like to move towards the closing because we are already at the top of the hour we did undertake to have this for um, two hours so steve any any response you might want to have might want to give oh just that that alice has addressed the the question in the comment and that this is an area that mozilla is interesting in very interested in and uh, will follow up on okay thank you thank you very much now one more comment barack you had unmuted your mic um perhaps i'll allow you to make one comment and then um i can move on to the next segment which will be the closing yeah, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, I know that there's a lot of tension uh, between uh, the uh, traditional operators or tier one operators uh, and uh, probably community network entrants. But uh, at the same time, uh, I want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, CA for not only being progressive, but being bold. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a conference I attended in 2004 known as Radio Africa. And uh, I recall uh, some scientists from the International Center of Theoretical Physics uh, setting up Wi-Fi for us in the conference room at the then Multimedia University, at the Kenya College of Communications Technology, which is now Multimedia University, uh, using Teams. And we were able to work with that particular Wi-Fi. And uh, I remember some of the participants asking why we couldn't just use the Cisco equipment. But that's the difference between a developed country and a developing country. So we have to take some bold steps to break the glass ceiling if we are to move forward as a country. And I want to believe where we are moving as a country, uh, local solutions to local problems are the way to go. So in as much as it is not clear, uh, I think uh, I would wish to say that uh, we let's learn to live with the creative tension and make sure that uh, community networks actually uh, get to work for our communities. For a long time, uh, the whole issue of uh, spectrum and networking uh, has been foreign to us as a people. You know, we've either been reading it in books or uh, relying on international exp expertise. Uh, but this is an opportunity where we are getting to understand more about spectrum and how to use it. And I want to imagine if there hadn't been a bold move uh, to allocate 2.4 and uh, 5.8 under the industrial, scientific and medical uh, bands, where would we be? 
many people would not even have been connected uh, during this kind of uh, during the kind of pandemic that we have faced. So I'm I'm requesting that for purposes of innovation and to move forward, uh, let Spectrum be available to the community affordably so that we can be able to spur innovation. Just the way Michuki said, uh, back in the day, uh, we used to go, our, 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 our family members used to go to rivers uh, because uh, we could not afford pipes. Uh, but right now, very few people go to rivers because the pipes were made available and uh, all the policy measures that needed to be made for pipes to be availed in our local villages were made. So in the same way, uh, let's push the boundary and make sure that uh, spectrum is available affordably and uh, for purposes of uh, promoting innovation and for purposes of enabling our community members to be able to connect uh, to the internet or communicate affordably. So I just wanted to stress on that point while I thank CA uh, for the bold step that has been taken. taken. Thank you very much. Thank you for your swift comments, uh, Barak. I would now like to just ask Mr. Charles Juma, um, who we didn't have the opportunity of, of listening to, to make his, um, I suppose, closing remarks now that we were about to close, Charles. <laughs> over to you for perhaps um, 90 seconds. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Steve. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Juma. My apologies, I couldn't join at the beginning of the session, but I joined somewhere in the middle and have managed to join and listen to most of the presentations. Quite an exciting, uh, you know, experience. Um, yeah, as part of my closing remarks this time around, uh, I want to thank uh, CA and, and partners, APC, uh, Kicktonet, Strickland University, and the facilitators for this forum for having made it uh, happen. For the benefit of um, uh, the members on the, uh, in this meeting who might not have heard about the Digital Access Program, it's a global program by the UK government, currently implemented in five countries, Nigeria, um, Kenya, South Africa, Brazil, and Indonesia. Uh, what we want to uh, achieve during this short period is to basically catalyze what we are considering as affordable, inclusive digital access models, um, especially for the extreme population. So quite exciting to listen to the presenters and the panelists um, articulating the need for, you know, having the community members, people in the rural areas, people who are disadvantaged, actually being able to access this public resource. And that's what we feel we can contribute to this um, agenda and discussion in these particular countries. Um, yeah, we've been collaborating with CA. Um, recently on several uh, projects. This one is one of them. Of course, we also are aware of the TV wise space regulations that is also awaiting uh, publications and, and also, you know, some uh, voice and data gap assessment. Um, I want to acknowledge that we also worked with other government agencies, including ITA, uh, the Office of Data Protection Commissioner, Huduma Kenya, COVID-19 COVID ICT Advisory Committee. Uh, we're also working with uh, other donors. I uh, think uh, acknowledging that I've seen um, Olu Oltola from USAID in the forum and, and other donors, including UNICEF, um, the World Bank, and you know, GIZ and the European Union, just to make sure that we support jointly the digital transformation for Kenya. Um, local partners I've also seen in the room, including Strathmore, Afrality, Inspire, APDK, Acquict, uh, Calro, Visca, and many others, Mawingu, Knet. Um, who are helping us around um, showcasing the models, either around connectivity or emerging technologies, local content, local relevant digital content, uh, digital skills. So we are grateful to all of them. Yeah, so without much ado, and, and given that I'm coming at the tail end of this, so the conversation around scalability, sustainability, uh, value proposition, um, you know, Commitment to all this is, is something that we think we can contribute to and we're happy and available to uh, continue the collaborations with everyone, including government regulations, the government regulators like CA. We are pleased and uh, honored to have received this kind of hospitality and, and, and support from CA. And we just want to echo um, Madam Alice Munoz's uh, comments around CA. We want to confirm the same, that CA has actually been very progressive 
and then there is advance we can see and also looking into the future that uh, looks like the this whole conversation around universal access for everyone is most likely going to be realized uh, through regulators like like ca so thank you everyone happy to engage directly with anyone um over what digital access program is is positioned to do maybe in the last in the next few few years since we are a donor driven and donor funded uh, project we don't exist forever but we just want to showcase what we feel uh, we can showcase and we leave it to the community members and the governments to, to to take this to the next level so again grateful to apc our global partner we also have other global partners by the way so association for progress communications just one of them but we also have kpmg i think i saw kpmg in the room who are helping us out with the um, pillar two of the program, which is around building trust and resilience within the online spaces. Um, I think we also collaborate, we're also collaborating with ITU, uh, British Council, uh, Digital Impact Alliance. So yeah, and you know, among many other local organizations that I also mentioned earlier. So thanks everyone and, and bye, and thanks Steven for this opportunity. And great, I think uh, in as much as you think you're uh, fairly beaten, but you look look a bit younger than uh, you, know, you might imagine. So thanks very much. And, and for the sharp, uh, you know, attire, you know, we refer to that as attire, where I come from. Thanks, and bye. <laughs> okay, I should probably go mute at this point. Um, it, it is the oil I use on my face, Charles, but anyway, let me not digress, we need to close. Um, Steve, uh, you indicated that you needed to respond to a question from Heiko live. Is that possible that you could keep that very short, um, just so that we can really close um, in, in, in the very shortest time possible? Um, no, that's fine. I've sent a brief response by text. We, I think we can draw to a close. Okay, very well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, before we just do the close, I'd just like to point out, um, and, and thank you really all the participants. Thank you all the panelists for your uh, very engaging um, discussions. Um, some of the questions and we, which started very early on in the presentations uh, were very sort of full on and, and have provided food for thought and consideration, not just by the consultants, but also by the CA um, and, and, and other people that are involved here. Uh, so there's a follow-up discussion that's gonna take place um, on the Kicktonet mailing list. Um, obviously, if you're not on the Kicktonet mailing list, then you need to sign up. Um, there will be a follow-up discussion on this particular issue on the mailing list on the 25th and the 26th of May. So um, the link should be posted on the chat if that's possible. Um, and it will be helpful if then you can sort of um, yes, it's been posted on the link. The, it's been posted on the chat, the link where you can um, join up and follow up on the discussion. So I'd like to say thank you very much to the participants for coming forth. We've had um, quite a number of participants and we are grateful for uh, that, that you've been able to attend right up till this point. We obviously want to thank all the partners here. We thank the CA obviously for taking the lead in this. We are grateful for the support that the CA has continued to give um, to the APC, the consultants. Thank you for the very good work that you have done and continue to do. Thank you to the uh, British High Commis Commission and the United Kingdom for the support that it's given to the various partners in enabling this work, including the University of Strathclyde. So I want to wish you all a good afternoon. Uh, please join us on the mailing list um, at Kicktonet on the 25th and 26th so that we can continue this discussion. Do remember that the paper um, is, up, is up on the CA website for further discussions and reversions up until I believe it is the 11th of June, if I'm not wrong, uh, but you'll find more details there. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.